So Carrie, we're out here at uh, Zaka Station for the RMZ intro. And we're sitting there just chatting and I was just cracking up thinking about what a journey your life has been. <laughs> from when you, when you and I first became friends, you were, you know, privateer racing and, you know, the heart luck guy with his baggy gear and everything. So, man, what a journey. Did you ever imagine your wildest dreams you'd be where you are today? It's definitely been a crazy run, you know, like I never, I mean, especially, you know, mentally kind of going back to, you know, back in the late 90s and I, I hit like a weird turning point and, and luckily freestyle kind of reeled me back in. But you now after Supercross in 98, I was, I was done, you know, like I wasn't getting any support and, you know, back then it was like a very clean cut image and I had tattoos and was wearing baggy gear racing and I almost, uh, I almost hung it up and went back to school and you know, then the freestyle thing kind of started to take off and was getting little gigs here and there and, and it kind of took off and running. And then, you know, then it just opened up a whole new world and segued into businesses. And yeah, it's been a pretty wild ride and to, to be here, you know, sitting here and, you know, my, my semi's down the road at Castillo's place and, yeah. <laughs> you know, to have a super cross team and doing a motorcycle test for Suzuki is pretty amazing. So, I mean, okay, 98, KX250, flesh gear baggies. <laughs> <laughs> you know, made a main in baggy gear. Yep. I mean, it was a struggle back then, and you were definitely a sore thumb. Stood out, you know, the, the baggy gear guy. But how was it for you segueing into the freestyle thing? It, it, it was. It was kind of like an overnight thing. You know, like I said, uh, you know, I'd been doing a lot of film trips, and you know, back, you know, back then it was just filming primarily. Yeah. You know, when I was when I wasn't racing and. You know, I, I wrapped up the Supercross series in 98, and if I remember right now, you know, back then it was kind of like me and Jason Thomas and like Ryan Huffman were like the three guys kind of making mains. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and those guys went on to get rides and the phone wasn't ringing. And, you know, I remember going home, you know, I remember driving back home after Vegas Supercross, and I didn't even do the outdoor series that year. I was just kind of like a whip puppy dog, and I'm figuring, you know what, I'm just going to take the summer off and I'm going to enroll in UNLV and start going back to school. Just, I was going to go be an accountant. And, uh, which isn't that random <laughs> and uh and i got the phone call to do the warp tour and you know so i said all right you know i'll, I'll go on the road for this summer I'll, I'll go spend six weeks i'm gonna make like a grand a week and per diem so save up a little bit of cash to start school and you know come home and enroll and, and literally it kind of snowballed you know i did warp tour and then i came back and there's a couple like little one-off contests i made like remember i made like 1500 bucks at the uh at the costa mesa jump contest with like me and metzger and a few other guys and i just kind of kept riding the wave i'm like ah all right next month all right next semester i'll sign up next semester and yeah. it literally just bit by bit and i think that's kind of why it, it, it kind of worked so well for me because it wasn't like this pressure like all right i'm gonna go do this i was i was already out the door i just figured out ah, i'm just gonna make a couple bucks and see how it goes yeah. and it's just here i am 20 years later almost i remember the first time i saw a photo of the heart attack i mean i was holy shit talk about that like, everyone asked you about the back foot talk about the heart attack like, where'd you get the idea for that well the funny thing is like uh you know that i i was doing every summer actually summer and winter times i was doing uh the warp tour and for me it was paid practice you know we would do ramp to ramp setups we do three demos a day six days a week and i was just going out trying new stuff i mean that's how i learned how to do seat grabs you know kawasaki that year had that weird handle and i started grabbing it i mean you start doing that much riding three times a day you start to try to get a little creative and i didn't actually realize that's what was happening i didn't know my feet were kind of going as high i just back then before i was having fused spines i was like i guess i was flexible and i didn't realize it until i saw seeing photos of it and uh i remember troy the uh, i think he was filming like Rathchild. He came out to Warp Tour and filmed with us one day, and he was one that kind of said something like, "Yo, like, do you see this?" And showed me some playback, and my feet were way above my head. I'm like, oh, I didn't even really realize it. It all kind of felt the same to me. <laughs> so it was just like a natural evolution, and then, uh, you know, taking that to Rhode Island that year it kind of was a big deal. So. And then, so you, I mean, could you have been the first guy to cut a grab hole? Well, I mean, like I said, the in '98 the Cowie had that natural grab hole, yeah. and but it was little. I <coughs> it mean, was it tiny. Precise. Yeah, it, it was tiny. But like I said, you know, you you spend six weeks on a war, on warp tour, hitting ramp to ramp all day long. You start getting creative, like finding new places to hook hands and feet to, wow. and um, yeah, was, I learned I learned seat grabs uh, in '98 on warp tour, and I came home to that Costa Mesa contest, and I won that contest with a seat grab. 
and I remember doing it and you know my buddies I was on tour with you know Link and Feist and everybody they'd seen it all summer so it wasn't that big of a deal but you know to go to Costa Mesa and do it and you know and, and beat Metzger and all the all the dudes at the time it was yeah. kind of it was kind of a big deal cool so we have a feature coming out in the uh, September issue about the backflip and the evolution of it and everything but just real briefly reflecting on it I mean you completely changed the sport of freestyle and was there a race to do the backflip or were you the only guy that was thinking of doing it back then that you know um, I don't know honestly if there's a race because at that point, um, you know, I I kind of got burned down living in California. I moved back to Vegas. Um, I was living next door to TJ Lavin. Me and him were like inseparable. We would ride BMX in the morning and go to the you know go to the local moto track at night. I had a I had one jump set up at the local moto track, and um, I think spent so much time with TJ and you know watching him do flips and spins and stuff on his bike. That's when we kind of started talking about it, you know, and. Uh, so he, said, he told me, he's like, look, I know the guys at Woodward really well, you know, Ed and Gary and those guys out there. He's like, let's go out there, teach you how to flip a bicycle, get you comfortable upside down and see where it goes. And so we actually went out to Pennsylvania and spent about seven days there and I mean, did hundreds and hundreds of flips on my bike into the foam pit and the resi mats and kind of took it step by step and just got very comfortable being upside down. And, and like I said, the natural progression was just uh, to take it to dirt. Yeah. and. I remember coming back from Woodward and uh, you know a few months went by and and then me and TJ are talking about like you know what's the ideal situation you know like you know going back then in theory you think okay you need a perfectly good transition vert wall because you know you got to go straight up you know because that's just the only thing you can really think of you don't think about flipping in a gap and you know we used to we were playing around the dirt and kind of shoveling stuff out and uh, and I, I remember I built kind of like this cliff jump on my on my dirt landing out there and I was just hitting it and just kind of visualizing you know like the bike was really smooth and stable and it wasn't like compressing super hard so so I, I think this is it yeah. so uh, you know my old man he built the the gravity games course that year so we kind of just mocked off of one of the landings what we built out of my course and sent it nice was there ever any like uh question or doubt like man will the bike quit running when it's upside down or anything because I, mean, I know when we heard about the backflip the first time or you were thinking of it i was just like hey, you can't backflip a motorcycle you know I, mean? I think the biggest thing for me was it is i mean look we, we've all gone off a jump in your bike stalls and you know you, you can land with a clutch in or whatever like you can compensate that the big question was just if i was going to get the inertia going like actually yeah. get that thing spinning around and you know, I had in my head like this big drastic, when I first started doing flips on bikes, like this big drastic grunt pull and you know, it, it really wasn't that. Like I learned on a bicycle, like it's just, it's all about, you know, your body posture. And um, so like I said, it's just, it was kind of the unknown and you know, back then I was young and dumb and I still bounced when I hit the dirt. So I figured <laughs> that was the best time of any. Okay, cool. So transitioning forward a couple steps. You go from freestyle and the next thing was Hart Huntington tattoo, right? I mean, how did that come about in the 50 cent version of it? I, I mean, really in a nutshell, I, I wanted to do something that, um, you know, I wanted to start a business. You know, originally the, the funny thing is back then I was, I was kicking around the idea of doing like an action sports bar. You know, I was going to, you know, do a sports bar in Vegas. It's pretty common. And then um, when I first moved back to Vegas, you know, I'd spend a lot of time at Soul Expressions and all these cool tattoo shops in Southern California. And there was no really good tattoo shops. Um, so I figured, you know what, I'm just gonna, just for a fun little business, you know, nothing crazy, like a boys club, place to go hang out, I'm gonna open a tattoo shop. Then I started talking with, uh, I, I got introduced to George Maloof at the Palms, and me and him started talking, and I kind of figured, like, what do you think about doing a tattoo shop in your casino? And George was pretty cutting edge, you know, back then, he was, you know, one of the first casinos with a nightclub in it, and he's like, sounds like a plan. And uh, it literally was just a little hobby thing, it was just supposed to be a little thing on the side that, you know, didn't really take too serious, more like a place to hang out. and. Uh, and I think the effects, it's kind of funny, like, you know, you look at injuries in a very negative light with motocross, you know, like career ending injuries and, you know, it, it's, it's, it's kind of a plague with motocross riders. But uh, <clears throat> at the same time I had this big role to do this tattoo shop, I had a just devastating injury on the Tony Hawk tour and, uh, you know, broke both my legs, both my arms, almost, I mean, almost killed me, almost died. I didn't ride for a good three years. Around. Yeah. And uh, I didn't, you know, I, I didn't ride for about three years on it, but uh, but I was already in motion. We were getting ready to open the shop. And so I, I come home, I kind of recuperated the point where I could walk again, because I was in a wheelchair for a couple months. And uh, I, I knew I wasn't, if ever, gonna ride a motorcycle again. So I just put all of my time and energy into this tattoo shop. And that's where it kind of snowballed into doing the TV show and doing the clothing business and all the stuff around it. But I just immersed myself for that next 18 months in that business. So maybe that accounting, 
degree that you never got. <laughs> you coming in handy to count all that money, right? Yeah, well, it, it wasn't so easy in the beginning, man. It was actually a really tough business because uh, pre-TV shows, you know, tattoos were extremely taboo, and yeah. it was a little bit more understood in Vegas, but still isn't what tattooing is today. So, uh, you know, when, when we did that TV show, it really blew the blew the door wide open. How was how was it doing the TV show? Was it really? Because I mean, I've been around some reality shows that are kind of scripted. Was it a real reality show or was it like, did you handpick the customers who were going to get certain tattoos? Yeah, reality TV, it's completely changed from the time when we did Ink to now. Um, I mean, back then it was truly, it was actually a little too much reality. I mean, it was literally fly on the wall. I mean, we would spend probably 18 to 20 hours a day shooting. I mean, just cameras rolling, just waiting for something to happen. And, uh, you know, we did three seasons of Inked and, um, you know, it would take us about four months at a time to shoot a season. And we did four seasons of it. And it just, it got to the point where it, one, I, I couldn't focus on the other business aspects of, the, of it. I was just focused on this damn TV show and the business was starting to suffer a little bit. I mean, as much as it was building it up, it was suffering a little bit. And then kind of the straw that broke the camel's back with me with the television stuff was that's when they wanted to start placing people and creating love triangles. And, you know, <laughs> so our last season I said, you know what, guys, I'm done after this. Yeah. Uh, how did that work? Like people that came to get a tattoo had to sign a release that they're going to be on TV or... Was there a compensation for them? Like, did they get their tattoo free if they're on the show? Or? You know, uh, if, if I remember right, I mean, year one, it was it was all pretty loose, you know? I mean, people people would come in, like I said, because we'd be shooting for 18 to 20 hours yeah. a day. Yeah. <clears throat> if somebody came in, they had like an idea for like a, you know, a memorial tattoo or something family-based or whatever it might be, you know, because that's usually how the conversation starts with a tattoo artist and a client, you know, like, oh, I want this tattoo because. Uh -huh. And um, so if there would be like an interesting story along the way, we'd be like, hey, how about this? We'll pay for half your tattoo. And if you let us film it for television and do like a little Q&A afterwards. And that's it was cool. extremely just really organic and real at that point. It wasn't all this made up crap now. You're pretty famous, dude. Where do you think most of your fame and recognition came from? Uh, I would say it's definitely start out with the tattoo show. You know, I, I did my, my TV show with the, the tattoo shop. I did Surreal Life. You know, I, I've done a handful of TV over the years. Uh -huh. You know, and then obviously in more recent years, probably Snowball because of my wife, because I mean, mm -hmm. she's larger than ever right now. But, uh, and, and I, I appreciate it, you know, because I mean, it's, it's great to be recognized and the people that are like, oh yeah, you're the guy from the tattoo show or you're from, uh -huh. you know, that MTV show. But, uh, you know, but there's also times where it's like, you know, I, I appreciate that, but at the same time, it's like, you know what, I've, I was actually kind of the dude in motocross. Like, yeah. I had a really good, <laughs> solid motocross career. Like, I've got I, I, name after. I had a few firsts, you know, but uh, but they're like, oh yeah, you're the guy in the tattoo shop, or you, I saw you on your red carpet with your wife, you know? So it's it's like a slippery slope, but I, I appreciate it all. How do you feel when you're written about in the tabloids <clears throat> or general media things? Is motocross champion, Kerry Hart. <laughs> <laughs> oh god the tabloids that that you, you might have to change the memory card i'll, I'll go off on a tangent it, it's it's frustrating you know i mean it's it gets a little frustrating you know i mean it, you know pop culture has changed so much in the years and they want to see what you've eaten for breakfast and you know mm -hmm. and it's hard it's hard right now you know like trying to raise a little girl and have her understand like you know why are all these crazy people chasing my mom and my dad and why are they taking my picture you know it's yeah. uh it's hard it, it's it's had a different um has a different dynamic now than it used to. It used to be kind of fun and you know whatever, great. You get a picture, turn up in People Magazine, and now you know when you're trying to protect a three-year-old and she yeah. doesn't really understand, it's it's pretty frustrating. Yeah. So okay, fast forward to now. You are a privateer, struggling to make mains, pay your bills from race to race. Now you own a race team that's got factory Suzuki backing, and. Guys are coming to you begging for rides. I mean, how does that feel? It's such a strange twist. It's uh, it's definitely surreal, you know, to be in the position with the race team, you know, that we built over the years, and uh, you know, we're we're a factory Suzuki race team, you know. That was that was always my aspirations as a, as a racer. Is I mean, back then we were in box fans, but you know, I wanted to be in that factory box van with that factory motorcycle, and uh, it's a trip, you know. Like, uh, it's I I love honestly. I genuinely I. I don't do it for money because there's no money made in this sport. I mean, it's it, all the money made goes back into the team to make the team better. But I love going to the races so much, and I, I love being involved with the guys. And you know, since we've you know since Ricky's come on and Mark Johnson, our whole technical side, like I love going to the races and learning about this stuff and working with Kaipo and like really understanding like the nuts and bolts because I never had that good stuff as a racer. You know, I, I feel like I'm pretty good at marketing and I'm pretty good at I guess you know trying to 
sell some sponsors, but I, I've never really understood the technical side. And uh, but I, I really just generally love doing the race team. It's so much fun to go to the races. And you know, last year Redbud was my first, you know, kind of quote unquote factory race. You know, I got to uh, I got to do Am Day out of our factory semi, yeah. and I had a pretty bitchin' bike built for me. And it was uh, I, I think that was the most rewarding was when I when I pulled to Redbud last year, and I got to pull my bike off the stand <laughs> under the racetrack. Heck yeah. Well, dude, it's it's been awesome watching your your career progress and, and to see where you are today compared to when we're hanging out in the tunnel at Pontiac <laughs> or something. I mean, yeah. So congratulations. Cool. Thank that, you. Thanks for the time. All good. Thank you.